I'd like to wish everyone a very blessed Easter, a very holy Easter, and also a um, blessed holy uh, Easter season. The epistle pointed for today's Mass is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Brethren, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new paste, as you are unleavened, for Christ our Pasch is sacrificed. Therefore let us feast not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and of wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Gospel appointed for today's Mass is taken from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. At that time, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought sweet spices, that coming they might anoint Jesus. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre, the sun being now risen. And they said one to another, Who shall roll us back the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And looking, they saw the stone rolled back, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed with a white robe, and they were astonished. Who saith to them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he told you. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. To, to understand, I think, more fully uh, and to appreciate better the joy that we should have at Easter, uh, we must understand a few things uh, in order to achieve that understanding of what Easter really means for us. Uh, if we, during Lent, were attentive to our Lenten practices, uh, fasted, abstained, uh, did various mortifications, we did it for a purpose. We did it to make one, to make reparation for past sins. Likewise, we could do it that we might strengthen ourselves, strengthen our will, um, such that we can turn away from sin, be strong enough to resist the temptations of sin. And likewise, joined together with prayer, it enlightens the intellect so we can see two things, sin as it really is, and the goodness of God as he really is, and we can understand who we are and what we are created for. It, it enlightens the intellect. Prayer, especially joined together with penance, achieves this end. And if you were blessed enough to be able to attend the Holy Week ceremonies, uh, that likewise gave you a sort, of a, a sort of an insight into uh, what the joys of Easter should be like by seeing there even the sorrows of the suffering Christ. Um, but I'd like to just make mention that yesterday, of Holy Saturday, we led, we, uh, the church had, the, had me read 12 prophecies taken from the Old Testament. Uh, they were, uh, some were quite long, some were quite short, but nevertheless, if we, I'd like to go back and look at these 12 prophecies and just give a brief, very brief explanation of each one of them. Uh, and I think it'll give us an understanding, a little bit more understanding of maybe God's will, what God's will is, uh, the purpose for which we were created, the end for which we are created, and what we must do to achieve that end, how to turn away from sin, uh, and all the various aspects uh, that we might save our soul, ultimately. But... To not, so once again, to appreciate, I suppose, Lent and to appreciate um, the Easter season, let's go back and look at those 12 prophecies. The first prophecy, the first lesson, uh, was taken from the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Uh, and it just takes out one section of it, but at that, what, we, what I read in the Mass yesterday was the creation of man. God created the world in, in six days and the seventh day he rested. Uh, and man being part of that work, God created man. And, not crea and God created man out of nothing, created everything out of nothing. Uh, and out of his infinite love. Theologians tell us that God loves himself perfectly and, he ne and 
nothing, no created being can give him greater happiness. And this is part of the mystery of God. We don't understand God. Is that for some reason or another, he created the angels and he created man. And he wanted us to love him as if, as if we could add something to his love, which uh, that's the mystery. Theologically, he can't, we, we can't add anything to it. But God wants us to love him. And it must somehow or another give him a great love as well. So the very first lesson, we saw this great work of God. Then we read in there how it was deranged uh, by the malice of Lucifer himself. How he destroyed that goodness that God made when he created Adam and Eve and placed them in the Garden of Eden. The second prophecy, the second lesson, uh, gives us the downfall of man from the time of Adam and Eve how time went through and men became so wicked they never recognized God as their creator. They would not acknowledge him and they went against the natural law imposed upon them uh, which, we, which is found in, founded in our, within our hearts, our very soul itself, that they had total disregard of the commandments. For, as we look at the commandments, some are very clear and some not quite so clear. But all of them uh, would cry out and say, I must be obeyed. Uh, whether it's the fourth commandment, we honor our parents, or whether we don't kill or don't lie, we don't want someone to lie to us. We know, but people became so wicked that God, even we read in Scripture, says he repented of making man. But he found some good souls, Noah, and he commanded Noah to make the ark, and there to save himself and his immediate family. The ark represents the church. It's an allusion to the Catholic church, uh, which is a shelter for those that would be saved from the wickedness, uh, once again, of the devil, uh, the flesh and the world. All three, the flesh, the devil, and the world are the three sources of temptation. The third prophecy, uh, the church brings before us Abraham. In the Old Testament, Abraham, God promised Abraham that his seed, his prodigy, his descendants would be so numerous, they'd be scattered about and they'd be so numerous as the sea, as, as the sand on the seashore. And he had one son, Isaac. And God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son. And Isaac, not questioning the two commands, God, or the two, the two statements, God said his, his descendants would spread throughout the world, would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And God commanded him to kill his, to sacrifice his son Isaac. And he gathered materials to go to, to the place of sacrifice. God was going to let him to, uh, to where to sacrifice. And his son says, Father, he says, we have all the materials necessary for a sacrifice. Where is the sacrifice? And Abraham, his, his response was, God will provide. And when he prepared the sacrifice, tied his son up, uh, lit the fire, an angel stopped him and pointed to a sheep uh, that was to be sacrificed. And so he unbound uh, his son, sacrificed the sheep. And the lesson, the lesson is that how Christ carried his cross. Isaac carried the wood for his own sacrifice, and Christ carried his cross uh, likewise, uh, the, 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 the wooden cross that he was crucified on. Uh, the fourth prophecy is taken from the book of Exodus. The Exodus that's always referred to is the Exodus from, of the Israelites out of Egypt. They left Egypt only after the hand of God so moved the Egyptian king that he let God's people go. And then he repented of this. He sent his army back to bring the, Egyptians, or the, the Israelites back into captivity. And God opened the sea. The Israelites went through, closed them up, destroyed the Egyptian army. And that uh, is a symbolism of baptism. God, uh, Christ instituted baptism that we might be saved uh, from not the, the, the chains of the, of the Egyptians, but the chains that would chain us down by the devil, the flesh, and the world. Uh, the fifth lesson, we read how Isaiah, 
Isaiah um, was received the inheritance of, inheritance of Almighty God, reminding us that which is in store for us, that we don't sell our birthright, trade it off for a mess of pottage, but that God has something far greater uh, for those who are faithful and who don't sell off their, uh, bargain off or sell off their heritage uh, as Isaac's brother did. The sixth lesson, likewise, the book, uh, the book of the Old Testament, uh, the minor prophet of Baruch, uh, we're reminded that because of all the sins that we committed, we're really, we're not worthy of pardon. Because we sinned against an infant God, and no matter what sin it is, in a philosophical sense, every sin be- takes on a character of, of infinity, becomes an infinite sin, and we are finite creatures. We can't make infinite reparation. Therefore, we're not worthy of this. But yet, God gratuitously uh, forgave mankind, paid the price, God became man, died on the cross, that we might be saved. The seventh lesson carries on this same thought, is that we're saved that we might, as God created Adam and Eve and his descent, we were created for heaven. Not just for this world, we're created for heaven. So the seventh lesson, if you go back and read the seventh lesson, it talks about these bones, these dried out bones and, and the plains on the prairie, being reconstituted, being brought back together, flesh, sinew, bone, put all back together. And it's to give, it gives a reason for hope for us. It is the, dog, the dog, dogma of the resurrection. Uh, the eighth lesson, uh, we're told, we're shown there how we must be cleansed from ignominy, uh, that are how our soul must be cleansed from sin. Uh, and we see Isaiah for telling uh, how Christ would lavish favors upon his church, how he would watch over his church as he did the Jews. Uh, the ninth lesson was, uh, can be easily understood, for we see there the blood of the Lamb uh, being delivered, uh, and the, the Jews would, would sacrifice the Lamb uh, to remember the Passover. Uh, how it saved them from the avenging angel before they, left, uh, before they left Egypt. And the blood of the true lamb, the lamb of God, our Lord himself was shed, that we might be delivered from eternal death if we be faithful. The tenth lesson was taken, uh, it talks about the Ninevites, the city of Nineveh, where it was a pagan city, and they were lived an immoral life, like Sodom and Gomorrah. They, they were to be punished. God sent uh, Jonah there, and he told them, here's what's going to happen to you, because here's what you're doing. And the people listened, and everyone from the oldest, the eldest to even the youngest, uh, man and beast, they all fasted, abstained, did penance, wore sackcloth, and used, sat in ashes, and they achieved several things. They turned God's wrath aside. They drew his blessing down upon him. And uh, they were not destroyed. And, of course, the 11th prophecy uh, instructs us upon the obligation. If we go back and read it, we can read into it. The, uh, the obligations we have uh, that when we were baptized. Uh, Promise, we promise at our baptism to renounce Satan, uh, to be faithful uh, to the things of God, and we're reminded that God is the avenger of those who infringe upon his laws, the laws that are written in our hearts. We don't need to have Moses bring down the Ten Commandments, tell us that we must worship God, that we must keep one day holy, we must not use his name in vain, we honor our parents, we don't commit adultery. Uh, we don't kill, steal, lie. We aren't envious. God is the avenger of those who would break his laws. And the twelfth lesson uh, is the last instruction, which gives us a very clear knowledge of the warfare uh, that we will enter into in resisting these three sorts of temptation, the flesh, the devil, and the world. 
And the time will come when we will have to confess God before men uh, and we'll have to be resolved even if it means that we'll have to suffer, be tortured or even be put to death uh, rather than deny God or our Lord Jesus Christ. And I, in hindsight, we see there apostasies in the church throughout history uh, and we should learn from history. We should learn from history uh, that we have to stand firm to, our, to the dogmas that we know that the church teaches us. Purely as a, an aside, just put the sermon aside. Uh, the other day I was told that Francis said that there is no hell, that those who offend God, they just sort of disappear. Where they disappeared, I don't know. But there is no hell. That's heretical. God, our Lord himself, we read throughout Scripture, there is a consequence when we sin against God's laws. If we do not repent, we go to hell. And those who do repent, those who do live a, a state of grace, go to heaven. And for someone to say, I just want to say, when will people understand that heresy is what it is? It's, it's not the truth. It is a falsehood. Uh, and it, it takes away all of his authority. But putting that aside, uh, we must realize then that we will have trials. St. Paul reminds us that there will be those who will teach doctrine, false doctrines, People have itching ears and will go after these false doctrines. And he says we'll have to be aware of that because even the elect will be deceived if possible. And we know what happened 40, 50 years ago, even to this own day, even as we know how people have been deceived by having itching ears going after false prophets. And therefore, we have the history before us and we should learn from this. And what we see there in that last lesson, we see there those three young men would not compromise themselves for the faith, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and God saved them. That's sort of a, the history of mankind and God's hand, uh, God's intervention in man's favor that we might achieve our end. And so when we look at these 12 prophecies, we see there how and what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do these things, how things will be, ultimately that we might save our soul. And certainly, we come to Easter, we rejoice because Christ did die. He did save us from, from sin. And now we just have to work out our salvation, not as St. Paul said, not as one beating the air, but as one with a certainty, knowing what we must do and where we are going. May God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.